All right, good evening, everyone. Um, so I apologize for the technical issues. This was supposed to be a live meeting, um, but that didn't work out. So we're gonna schedule another one of those in the near future. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're recording ourselves answering the questions that were submitted, and this will be posted online. Uh, so I just wanna start by introducing Shanna Siegel, uh, who is with us from the Putnam County Health Department and also a Putnam Valley parent, so welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm just gonna sort of jump in and say a couple of things and then I'm gonna give Shanna a chance to uh, just introduce herself and then we'll jump right into the question. So I just wanna begin by uh, again, thanking all of the frontline workers and the essential uh, workers that are out there every day, our healthcare professionals and first responders. Um, certainly all your efforts are appreciated. Um, and go ahead, Shanna, you wanna say a little bit about your job at the health department? Sure, thanks Jeremy. So um, I'm a public health nurse at the Putnam County Department of Health. And as Jeremy said, I'm a parent here in Putnam Valley. Um, I had been selected to um, be the person that communicates first on a daily basis and then on a weekly basis with our um, superintendents throughout the county and our school nurses when schools were still in session. So um, that communication has continued and um, it's, a, it's been a really great relationship that we've built. So each week, um, every superintendent from the county checks in um, and as the health department, we share information that we think is pertinent um, and remember that even though schools are not open for children right now, um, our teachers are working, our school districts are working and um, there's a lot of planning that's involved for reopening whenever that may be. And I know that I've, um, I've mentioned this on other uh, messages that went out, but it was a true value to have you um, on the call. Actually, it was daily calls when this first thing started uh, every afternoon. And I know that not every uh, health department, given the size of the counties and the number of school districts, was able to maintain that relationship. But I could certainly say for myself um, and the other superintendents of Putnam County, it was truly a valuable um, opportunity to have a direct line to you uh, as this was all unfolding. So uh, I just wanted to thank you and your colleagues for your partnership throughout this process. All right, so the way I'm gonna address the questions, I believe we have 27 or 30 or so questions now. Uh, they keep coming in live. Uh, we broke them up into categories and I'm gonna do my best to answer them, but I wanna preface it by saying in many cases, the district is looking for the same information uh, that many of our community members are. And if I were to list uh, my top five questions that I have that I would love answered, they would probably be some of these same questions. So I'm gonna do my best to explain um, the answer questions that we can based upon the information that we currently have. And if it's a question that I don't have the answer for, I can say the things that we've considered. Uh, but the reality is, is a lot of this is gonna be guided by the governor and the state um, who are gonna, and, and they're gonna give us guidance, and then that'll be disseminated down to the schools and down to the local health departments. And then we'll continue um, to work collaboratively uh, to come up with best practices for what the potential opening of school will look like whenever that happens. So I'll just jump right in. So the first questions uh, I received had to do really grading and placement. Uh, specifically to how final grades will be calculated. Now I know each building has sent out guidance regarded uh, how third and fourth quarter grades uh, or third trimester grades will be going, um, but everyone will end up with a final grade. So in the case of the elementary and the middle school where they did first and second uh, quarter grades, those grades will be calculated into um, a final average using the first two quarters because the third and the fourth quarter are uh, pass or incomplete. The high school is continuing numeric grading uh, and they had a midterm, so their final grade will be calculated based upon their four quarters and the midterm being 5% of it. Uh, there will be no final exams, no regions exams, so they had to change the, how the final grades were calculated in that way. So final grades will still be issued in the middle school and the high school, uh, depending upon, and if there's any further questions, I certainly encourage you to reach out to uh, the building administrators to explain how that all works. The next question has to do with placement for next year. Um, obviously there's um, honors classes or accelerated classes. Each of the buildings has a plan for how those uh, students will be selected. But the, really, I think the, the plan moving forward for next year, it's really about flexibility. 
And um, if your child is not placed in a course where you think they deserve, I would encourage you to where, where they should be. I would encourage you to reach out to the guidance counselors and or the building administration. And we're happy to consider any and all requests. Uh, we understand these determinations are being made on less data than we would otherwise have. So if you have any placement questions um, and you think your child maybe should be in a different course than they're placed in, uh, I wouldn't hesitate to reach out to the guidance counselors and the district is committed to being flexible and making sure that students end up in, um, in the courses that they belong in. There was another interesting question that came in about uh, whether or not we will considering rostering students in the same classes as the previous year. Um, that's actually a conversation we have not yet had. Uh, it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure from a public health perspective if it would really improve um, anything, make anyone any healthier because those same students are passing each other in the hallways and they're on buses together. Uh, I don't know, Shannon, if you have anything about that. No. no, I don't see that there being an impact there, any change. Okay, so I'm happy to bring that up to our elementary school uh, administration and to have that, that conversation, but I think from a public health perspective, it's probably not uh, buying us anything. All right, so the next group of questioning is by far the greatest number of questions, and this is where all my questions would fall as well. They fall into what I'm calling a school opening category. And um, school opening could be either a school opening question related to this school year or when schools open uh, at some point or in the fall, we certainly hope. Uh, and then each of those sort of, they have a subcategory. So the first question really has to do with phasing and it's asking whether or not we considered bringing in um, one group of students before another. Now, that's an interesting idea. I know that Denmark uh, brought elementary school age students back and um, it's something that we know other countries are doing in terms of if you bring your elementary school age children back, you're providing the sort of the child care need for those who need it while continuing distance learning for middle school and high school students. Uh, one benefit of it is it increases our, our space and allows us to spread out those elementary school age students. But obviously there's um, many, many questions surrounding um, parents' willingness to leave their middle school age students home, what's gonna happen when parents go back to work and high school age students are home alone. Uh, there's certainly a lot of questions, but that's something that we've that we'll, we've already considered and we're gonna wait for guidance on how uh, to best move forward in terms of reopening schools. And that's gonna be a reoccurring theme as I go through these because this is obviously the category in which I have the most questions and uh, I'm hoping to get more guidance from in the near future. So the next one has to do with uh, if we open, if we would consider opening for only core academic subjects. Um, I haven't heard anything along those lines. I believe if we opened, uh, we would still offer our, our full array of classes, although certainly something could change. Um, there's still requirements in terms of the encores and electives and physical education. Those are also classes that are required by students. And I haven't heard anything with the state waiving those requirements. So. As of right now, I would imagine if we open, we would open for all subject areas. The next one question has to do with the structure of classes when we open in terms of, of what catch-up work will need to be done. Now, this is really a priority of ours for the summer in terms of uh, our teachers are rethinking their first month of school and to really taking the time to go back and to review those prerequisite skills that we know students will need to be successful in the next year. So that's something that we've already started those conversations. In fact, um, a lot of our conversations even this school year have focused uh, at the elementary school level about um, emphasizing those power standards, the standards that we know are going to uh, scaffold into the next school year. So if you're a third grade teacher and you know that these four standards are really important for students to be successful in fourth grade, that's going to be our emphasis um, into certainly June for sure, is to make sure that students really have those power standards down to better prepare them to be successful uh, next school year. So those are the phasing questions. And now we have a bunch of questions regarding really about attendance. Um, 
there's certainly a lot of concern out there from parents regarding um, when schools reopen. And again, I don't know the answer to that question, but when they reopen, what does that mean for students with pre-existing health conditions? Um, what does it mean for parents or families that are just not ready to send their, their children uh, back to school? And I mean, I guess my recommendation would be we would treat it like any other absence. If a, if a parent's concerned uh, of their child attending school because of pre-existing health condition um, on a normal basis, and, and they are now, then they certainly would have the right to keep their children home and the district would do uh, whatever it could to provide the student the work that they were, meet, that they were missing. Um, so certainly there would be no, uh, no penalty for parents who are doing that. Um, if you have an underlying health condition and a reason why you're doing it. I think the caution is, is that we can't, um, we can't have teachers teaching in school and also doing distance learning. So I think the part of the trade-off would be, yes, we, you would get your assignments and we would do whatever we could to support you, but we wouldn't be maintaining a simultaneous in-person instruction while also providing uh, distance learning instruction. So it would be more of the type of educational material you would receive if you were just simply absent for the day or homesick for an extended period of time. And that obviously there's a case by case basis and we would address all of those um, in that way. So next, so next talks to, and I'll start and then I'll defer to Shannon here. There's a lot of questions about from a public health perspective, if we open schools, what type of screening would we do or what assurances would we have that um, that would prevent sort of a, a wave of COVID-19 from spreading through our schools. So you want to jump in on that one, Shana? Sure. Um, so let me begin by saying, you know, Putnam County and Putnam Valley actually in particular, um, we're in a geographically interesting location. And so when you, if you're listening to the governor speak, he often talks about Westchester and Rockland. Um, and lately he's been talking about the Hudson Valley or sometimes the lower Hudson Valley. Um, and so I think when um, we're talking about the data and referring to data to make decisions, um, it will be interesting to see and very important to see where Putnam County falls in that data um, and that breakdown that we talk about. So most recently, um, Governor Cuomo talked about the antibody results just like as a preliminary. And there were a little over 10%, I think I have it here, um, a little over 10% in our area, Hudson Valley, including Westchester and Rockland, 10.4% um, in this preliminary antibody study that showed that 10.4% of the population in this region um, do have the antibodies to COVID-19. Now, what does that mean for us? I'm not exactly sure. You know, Governor Cuomo has said that by the end of this week, he'll be announcing some more guidelines for schools and what phase one reopening will look like for parts of the state when New York on pause officially ends on May 15th, he'll extend it for some areas. So if we're grouped in with that lower Hudson Valley, Westchester, Rockland area, for sure nothing's gonna change for us anytime soon. Um, if we're extracted from that into the next part of the Hudson Valley, where today he released guidance that hospitals in our area, Putnam County in particular, so Putnam Hospital could open for um, elective procedures again. Um, well, that will determine some of those, um, those pieces. So we're always gonna look to the science and then the next part is we're gonna look toward innovation. So there are gonna have to be um, some standards that are put in place that are universal um, but again, that will vary based on region, I imagine. Thank you. Thank you. So more information to come and certainly uh, we would expect guidance from the state health department, uh, which would then come down through the local health departments and then ourselves. So then the next question has to do with uh, precautions or how we would, we would react in the case where um, a student or even a faculty member were to come down or become sick while at school. I mean, I think our our procedures would remain in place um, to the way we operated at the very end before we closed uh, from the beginning of March to the middle of March, where anytime a student had a fever or we certainly um, stressed the importance of parents keeping their children home if they're sick, 
I would imagine that we would be, there would be an additional emphasis on, on both of those things, that if a child is to uh, develop a fever, although the likelihood is that fever is not related to COVID-19, we certainly would um, treat it to the greatest uh, degree possible, and we would do our best to make sure the child was um, isolated and then picked up from school uh, and allow the parents to um, contact their, their physician and decide how to best move forward. Uh, the same would hold true for our faculty, and we would really emphasize parents the importance of keeping your children home if they develop a fever and uh, to not send them to school. So I think those would, we would operate as normal uh, with an emphasis on the importance of those things to make sure that um, if someone does get sick that they're not exposing others. The similar precautions we would take during the flu season. Uh, the next question has to do with teacher attendance. Uh, the question is really about what happens if a teacher is not ready to return um, to school, if they fear for health reasons, if they can continue distance education. Um, that's not, that's probably not how it would work. If we open school, our expectation would be that all of our staff would return. Um, staff members, just like our students, would certainly have the ability, um, if they were worried for health reasons, to not return to school. Uh, they certainly would have the ability to do so, but we would likely look for um, a leave replacement or another way to fill that individual's classes. We wouldn't have uh, necessarily the teachers back teaching in person and having a teacher or two still home maintaining a distance learning environment. Uh, so that would be a, an all for one, one for all model. Um, as of right now, right? I guess anything could change. We can get guidance that says they only want half our teachers in at any given time and we would have to respond to that. All right, so the next couple of questions have to do with timing. Um, we were told by the governor to expect uh, information regarding the remainder of the school year and summer school he threw in. Uh, we are expecting to hear that this week. So we've made it through Wednesday and we haven't yet heard. So we're, we're down to two more chances. Um, so I'm obviously anxiously awaiting uh, a decision on what the remainder of the school year looks like. But these timing questions, again, I, I don't know what the timing means for summer school, uh, specifically our ESY program. We don't typically run a summer school program, but our extended school year program for those students who qualify for that. Uh, we're certainly making plans for both a physical uh, ESY program as well as a virtual one. And so, yeah, that's really the timing questions in terms of uh, what the timing will be and uh, when, when we'll be, we're supposed to find out this week. So hopefully by the end of this week, we'll have more information regarding the timing, at least for uh, what it means for the end of this school year. And I, I don't know when we'll know what it'll mean for the fall. Um, I mean, I think they would certainly, a period of time would have to go by before they made any decisions about what the return to school in the fall looks like, even though that's something that we're already considering um, many options for. The next couple questions have to do with social distancing. There's been a lot of talk about um, returning to school, but socially distancing themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns. Um, how many students can you put on a bus and still consider them socially distanced? How many students can you have in a cafeteria and have them considered socially distanced? How many students you can fit in a classroom? I know that answer. In most classrooms, it's about 13 students. Uh, that we can fit into one classroom and uh, still keep them socially distanced. So there's been a lot out there in terms of split schedules and rotating days and other ways in which schools could uh, limit the number of students that were together at any one time. So those are all certainly things that we're aware of. Uh, we're developing plans around if that ends up being the way the guidance goes. Uh, so really all of those things are on the table and we're considering all of the ways in which we can uh, potentially reduce the number of students in any one space at any given time, knowing that sort of regardless of when we open, that will be important. Um, so I think I covered that. The next question has to do with cleaning procedures. So uh, obviously we stepped up cleaning uh, while we were still open. We've since disinfected every space within our buildings, um, labeled it, dated it when it was in, closed and locked it. So we know that if we were asked to quickly reopen schools, we could do so safely, that all our spaces are 
disinfected and sanitized. Uh, but along the ways, we've also uh, we purchased some new equipment. We have um, sort of uh, stations that we can wheel into rooms that'll sanitize an entire classroom using electrostatic uh, cleaning stuff. So I know that's something that uh, has been out there and we have some of those. And it's just a way to obviously on top of the normal cleaning procedures that our custodians do every evening, uh, that's something else we can go in and sort of uh, for a second line defense to make sure that we're sanitizing spaces every evening. So we have those, uh, or we'll have those available in each building, um, as well as uh, a portable unit that we can use on buses and stuff like that. So when we open, I feel like from a cleaning standpoint, uh, we'll be in good position to make sure that all our spaces are as clean as they can possibly be with the understanding that as soon as the first um, person, student or faculty member walks back in, that space is no longer considered uh, sterile and, and the process starts all over again. So I don't know, did I leave anything important out of that piece, Shanna? No, um, I just wanted to add to that, that you know, as a, as a parent here in Putnam County in general, um, I, I think something that might be really nice for people to know um, is that our schools are not working um, just on their own here. They're, um, you know, there's this real great regional effort, and especially with the superintendents throughout Putnam County, um, to discuss all of these plans. So no one's being left out of somebody else's brilliant idea or um, somebody else feeling like another school nearby um, maybe has something that we don't have here. So there are, there are schools and there are daycares that, um, that right now have already implemented different screening procedures for, for children coming in um, who are children of essential workers, screening their temperatures, not allowing parents into the building. Um, and so all of that is being taken into account when our schools are developing their NPI plans, their non-pharmaceutical intervention plans and recovery plans for when school does resume in person. Um, and so I just, as a parent, want everybody to know that Putnam Valley and the other schools in our county um, are really putting a lot of thought into this planning. And so every possible scenario is being covered. And when questions arise, like Dr. Left already said, that, oh, I hadn't, we hadn't discussed that yet, it will be brought back to the group and there will be more discussion around it to figure out what the next best thing to do is. Thank you. So I'm gonna throw the next question to you as well. So the next question has to do with whether we anticipate staff and children being required to wear masks when school reopens. This is, um, this is the difficult question. We have experienced this with childcare that are, um, centers that are open right now that are again offering childcare, um, particularly to children of essential workers. So we know that their homes are at higher risk than many of us who, um, are mostly staying at home except for essential trips. Um, those children are not currently wearing masks here locally. The workers are, they're required to now by the state to wear face coverings. So, um, but if we look to what's happening in parts of Asia, Japan reopening some schools now, they're having their students wear facial coverings and in some places hats, maybe you have seen it. Um, I didn't believe it when I first saw it, but it turns out it's true that, you know, keep them apart several feet, not quite six feet, but do keep them apart several feet. So, um, you know, I don't have an answer for if the students will be wearing face coverings. I do think that some of these things we would have never imagined before will stay in place for a while. They won't just disappear overnight. So we may see a return to school where um, teachers or some staff are wearing coverings. Yeah, I think that's uh, the reality is setting in on many, especially myself, that when school opens, uh, regardless of when that is, it, it is very likely not going to look like school did uh, before it closed. And I think that all of these questions about social distancing and health re uh, health precautions and things like that, I think the reality is probably all of those things in some way, shape or form will be in place uh, when we're allowed to reopen schools and that it may not be as interrupted as the school year has been, but it definitely is likely not to be as normal as previous years have been. And I think that's just our reality for at least the next school year, um, and hopefully not any further. But I don't want to set any false expectations that come September, 
schools will open and classrooms will be full and people will be hugging and and <laughs> carrying on like kids do because yeah. um, that's likely not going to be where we're at uh, come this fall. So the next couple questions have to do with the distance learning that's currently taking place now. Uh, the first question was really about if there could be more uh, direct interactions between teachers and students. So I know this is something that our building administrators have been working closely with our teachers on. I know that some teachers do this really well. Um, and I think uh, one of the good things that I've seen is there's a lot of sharing going on between teachers. And that if a teacher has uh, a way in which they're conferencing with small groups of students uh, over video and that's working really well, they're sharing that with their colleagues. So I think like everything else, um, we'll continue to get better at it. I think that um, even though we saw the potential for this and started planning for this closure period, I think in the back of our minds, we're thinking two weeks. Uh, when we closed in March, I don't think anyone envisioned the possibility of it being closed for the rest of the school year. And I know that teachers are really working as hard as they possibly can to make that distance learning experience as close to the in-class learning experience that students are missing out on. And the reality is it never will be. Um, our distance learning will never be as effective as our in-class instruction will be. But there's certainly a tremendous amount of effort being put into making those two as close uh, as they possibly can. So I would expect as the year goes on that there'll be more and more opportunities for interactions with students, whether it be within small groups, whether it be just within a social context, like a morning meeting for students to be able to see each other, uh, and then the teacher being able to, to do an actual lesson through an asynchronous method as opposed to trying to do it with 20 kids screaming on a Google Meet. So the next question is sort of the opposite. Uh, this parent's concerned about the level of workload and they're asking if there can be less work assigned during this distance uh, learning period. I, I appreciate the difficulty that parents are experiencing. Uh, many parents are working from home uh, while also trying to support their children academically. And that is um, sometimes an impossible task. And I guess my, my recommendation for anyone would be that we want sort of a best effort approach to any of these things but it shouldn't come at anyone's at, a, at an emotional or social uh, price for anyone and that if your child can't get through your work and their work and you're not available to help them because you're working that you simply reach out to the teacher and just let the teacher know that they weren't able to complete this work and and we'll explore options or ways in which we can make sure the appropriate amount of work is being sent to each of our students. So um, I guess that's the, the ask is just for a, a best effort approach, but I, don't, I certainly don't want to add any stress or anxiety to the situation. Um, so if your child's not able to get through their work, again, communication with the teacher would be key, uh, but there's, at least at this point, there's not going to be any negative uh, consequences for that. The next couple of questions have to do with communication. Uh, there was a question about consolidating the number of emails that are sent. I'm sure I'm partially to blame for that, um, <laughs> sending emails. But unfortunately, it's part of the, the way that Google Classroom operates. If we have parents sign up to receive emails or students get emails based upon assignments, each of those Google Classrooms is its own entity. So they don't speak to each other and they can't consolidate emails although that's a great uh, recommendation for Google to develop that into their software. So right now students would get individual emails from each classroom just because that's the way the system is built. Uh, so there's unfortunately no way to consolidate emails. I know my, just since this closure period, my, the number of emails I receive a day has gone from about 100 to well over 200 emails a day because that's, that's the means in which people are communicating. So. Um, I can't really offer any help on the email front, although I can share in the, the frustration. The next question was about technical issues. Our technology department is continuing to work. Uh, they're here every week handing out new devices. So if anyone's having trouble with their computer, accessing things, I would encourage them to reach out to the teacher or find a teacher first. If they can't be assistance, they can get you in touch with a technician. And if the device isn't working, uh, like I said, they're here every week. We can swap out devices in a, uh, in a 
socially distanced way uh, to make sure that everyone has working technology. And maybe part of that public service announcement is, I know when we closed for a couple of weeks, people were prepared to uh, make do with the devices they had. But as this stretches on and uh, people are sharing devices, it becomes more and more of an issue. So I know all students in the middle school and the high school have their own devices, but elementary school age kids and many times are sharing devices with parents. So if there's an additional need for devices, we have them. Well, I just ask that you reach out and let us know and we can arrange for a device for your child uh, so they can complete their work uh, without having to share with a sibling or with a parent. And then, so the next question I do with budget. So how is this whole thing affecting the school budget? That is a great question. Um, during the closure period, uh, the district's incurring some savings, although we are obviously paying our payroll, we're still continuing to pay our employees, and that's uh, the vast majority of our budget goes to those two. Um, but there is some savings. Uh, but unfortunately, the state has already rolled back our state aid increases for this year, which has resulted in a $600,000 deficit that we um, are forced to, to fill already. Now, we took several different approaches and we spoke about it at the board meeting, how we were able to, um, to change our budget to address that initial $600,000 gap. But as I'm sure you've heard on the news, there was a fear for second and third and possibly fourth round of state aid cuts. And our reality is if those come to fruition and uh, the federal government doesn't provide the state it needs to, to balance its budget. I think the state's looking at over a $13 billion deficit as a result of COVID-19, that um, we anticipate there being more state aid cuts in where our unfortunate reality is at this point that additional cuts are likely gonna mean program and, and staffing uh, changes because that's the only place we have left to look after already reducing the 600,000. So uh, we certainly plan on uh, taking any savings we incur during the closure period and using that to offset our uh, loss in revenue from the state. But and moving forward, additional cuts are, are not gonna be great for our staff and our programs and certainly not for our students. So that's a, a, a sad um, unattended consequence of this whole thing is, uh, is what it means for schools and budgets and we certainly share with every school district in New York State that's struggling with the same thing. So the next question has to do with uh, the construction. So as many are aware, or if you've driven by the middle school, high school campus, you can see that the construction continues. Um, we, were, we got a waiver to continue construction throughout the closure period, being um, the work that was being done uh, was of essential capacity, water mains and HVAC, and other things that needed to get done if we were able to, if we were going to be able to be able to reopen schools. So that work continues. Uh, the question is whether we'll be ahead of schedule. Uh, I mean, right now we're certainly ahead of schedule. Uh, we're, we're waiting guidance for what the rest of the school year will look like, and that would obviously also change our schedule in terms of how quickly we, we would be able to get done. But the the work continues. Um, everyone involved knows that at any given point in time, the governor could tell schools to reopen, and they have to be able to uh, get the buildings in a condition where we, where we can reopen them. And um, until we know that, they're going to continue to progress in a way that allows them that flexibility to continue going or to stop at any given point in time. So construction continues, and I'm certainly hopeful that they'll finish uh, ahead of time. The next question had to do with before and after school programs. I think this along the same lines of, um, of the childcare we provide for first responders and the future of summer camps and things like that. I think um, the programs will be afforded the opportunity to reopen and, and they'll probably have to practice many of the same precautions that the schools will. But at the same time, those um, just like daycare centers now, uh, they'll be provided the flexibility to not open if they decide it's not in their best interest to do so. So I think before and after school and, and 
summer camps and things of that nature, it's really going to be a case by case basis whether or not they operate and at what capacity they operate. And obviously, everyone will be guided by the regulations that come down from the state. Um, so we have a, hold on, my computer's making noise. So we have a couple uh, questions that just came in. I got to read them first. And Jeremy, I'll just add to that then that the, the child care um, centers that are operating right now um, that are state licensed child care centers, they don't have to follow the um, physical distancing of six feet um, that we're all following when we go out um, to a supermarket or to a pharmacy. Um, it's very different in those settings right now um, because they can't provide quality child care from six feet away screaming at a child to do something or, you know, um, so that doesn't mean that that's how it will be in schools, but childcare centers right now are definitely held to a different standard um, necessarily to continue to do they work, the work that they do so that people who must show up for the essential jobs that we rely on um, can do that. Thank you. So the next question has is actually a great question. Uh, it asks about whether or not students will still have access to sort of the instructional resources and tools that they have available to them now over the summer. So, I mean, I anticipate the direct instruction aspect of uh, distance learning would end at the conclusion of the school year, but we certainly pay for those educational tools, those online uh, apps and programs throughout the summer. So at some point we would have to um, promote students from one grade to the next, which obviously changes many of those programs. But I would certainly imagine us uh, at the end of the school year sending out an updated resources list and letting parents know which resources are still available, which ones may be available at your current grade level for a period of time until we promote your child to the next grade level. But certainly we can put an emphasis on making sure that uh, those instructional tools are still available to parents throughout the summer as a way to help students continue learning and hopefully make up for any um, lost instructional opportunities that they've incurred during this closure period. So that's a great question and something we'll certainly make sure we get that information out um, to everyone. So the next question has to do with fourth quarter grading. Again, I think the, the building sent out a very detailed explanation for how this will be done. And um, if there's any questions, I would certainly encourage uh, your children or yourself to reach out directly to the teacher. And uh, if that doesn't answer your question, certainly directly to the building administration. So it has to do with just how the fourth quarter grades will be uh, figured out at the high school where they're staying with a numeric grade. And I think uh, a lot of it will be effort-based uh, grading uh, in terms of the students are really uh, showing uh, dedication to complete the work uh, to the best of their ability. I'm sure that'll be a big piece of it. <clears throat> so the next one has to do with, uh, again, I think it's a, a real-time question regarding uh, absenteeism at the high school. I know the high school shifted to start taking attendance uh, using uh, PowerSchool. It's been, um, there's been a lot of information from the state regarding how school, a lot of questioning from the state regarding how we're keeping track of students that are participating in the distance learning opportunities. So there's documentation is an important piece for us. We have to know what students are participating and then we reach out individually to students who are not participating or engaged within the learning. So one of the ways we're documenting that is by uh, using at the high school level, using PowerSchool, I think the middle school is using more of a Google form. Uh, to keep track of what students are participating and it's just important to know uh, what students are engaged in learning and which ones aren't. Uh, so this is a specific question regarding excused versus unexcused. I'll certainly follow up with uh, the building administration, uh, but I think it's likely just um, just related to the fact that they just started using this and PowerSchool wasn't built to uh, mark students as excused or unexcused when they're learning from home. Uh, so it's a question I'll follow up with the building administration about, uh, but I certainly would not be concerned if um, if you were getting an unexcused absence in power school during the closure period. 
And then the last question is about our senior activities, but I'll even broaden it to uh, a wider range of activities. I mean, certainly the spring and the end of the school year, we have a tremendous amount of recognitions and celebrations that are going on across the school district. Um, and we're gonna do everything we can to still honor those traditions and those um, opportunities to acknowledge our students. So it's gonna look very different than it has in the past. And, um, but I think it's important that students still, uh, still have an opportunity to be recognized. So fourth grade moving up, eighth grade moving up are obviously uh, gonna look different. Graduation is a daily topic of conversation. We're constantly having conversations about what a potential graduation could look like. And we have a wide range of ideas and that'll all be governed by what we hear from the governor regarding uh, guidelines or the Department of Health regarding guidelines at the end of June and what it'll look like. But um, some parents have started sharing ideas. I know the students have been involved working with Dr. Andrieri and uh, Mr. Mello. And I mean, everything's on the table. We're gonna do everything we can to honor those graduates in, in a way that's as close to what typically happens. And it, it's, it's certainly not to be exactly the same, but we're holding out hope that we can get it as close to that as possible. And the same holds true for senior awards and I know questions about the prom and other things like that, that are just, um, everything's on the table and we're still just, we're gonna have to address it with, with the information we have at that time but we're considering uh, a multitude of options for each of those events uh, to make sure that uh, regardless of whether it's a physical or virtual uh, based event that it's still, uh, the students are still uh, acknowledged. So I think that's the end of the questions. Do you have anything else for the good of the cause? Um, I will just add that I know um, the uncertainty is extremely challenging um, for all of us. And, um, you know, when you when you look for information, which is what everybody's craving, um, just to, you know, take that with a grain of salt. We share widely the data that we receive for Putnam County residents that have been um, diagnosed with lab confirmed positive cases of COVID-19. And today, you know, we're over 1,000 in our county. There have been um, over 40 deaths related to COVID-19 in Putnam County. So the data is shared, it's available, but it's not comprehensive. And so whether you're looking um, on Putnam County websites um, or news sources, or you're looking at the state um, information that's shared, um, just remember that that information is available because it's collected, but it's not comprehensive yet and it won't be for a long time. Um, and if you have questions regarding COVID-19, you can always um, email the health department at COVID-19 at PutnamCountyNY.gov. Um, we'll answer COVID-19 related questions. We're available um, via email and you can find us on social media at um, Putnam Health NY. And um, you can always call 211. So 211 is fielding calls about COVID-19 all the time as well. Thank you. So I think a couple of things that I wanted to touch on before we end here is, one, to apologize the fact that our, uh, our live capacity here did not really work out as planned, but I have uh, promised to schedule another meeting uh, in another couple of weeks. Hopefully we have new information, and by then we'll have new questions. And um, we'll be sure to get that off the, off the table and get it working. Uh, but I really wanted to understand sort of the stress and the anxiety that's associated with this. Um, on cold, rainy days, people are locked up inside their house, uh, trying to do a tremendous amount of work and take care of their children. And I just think it's important that everyone take a time, take the time necessary to sort of maintain their own uh, emotional state and, and to maintain that level of, of wellness for yourself and for your family. And that I think is the most important piece. So whether it be work related or academic or school related, that people take the opportunities and the time they need to um, take care of themselves. And I think that's the most important thing that we can do. The, the other thing I wanted to talk about is, obviously as this closure period um, prolongs, there's a greater and greater uh, amount of need within the community. Um, people are unemployed, they have no salaries coming in. Um, 
obviously the district, we're doing whatever we can. Uh, we've moved to a free meals for all program. So for any community member, for any student in the community who would like breakfast or lunch, they can sign up and get it for free, regardless of what your pay status was while school was open. So that's something that we're doing, but um, we're also receiving an outpouring of support from community members who are um, anxious to help their, their neighbors and other community members. So the district is, is happy to sort of be the liaison uh, between uh, those with needs and those who are looking to, to give. And that's something that we're working on now is developing um, sort of a spreadsheet of what individuals are looking for. And we'll put in procedures for how we're willing to collect and to distribute those materials. So really we're gonna sort of um, make the match between uh, those in the community uh, in need and those that are looking to help. So it's something about Putnam Valley uh, always seems to come together in, in moments like this. Uh, I also feel that we have an unfair number of these crisis moments uh, over the past few years, but it certainly always brings out the best of the community. So I did want to acknowledge um, that as well. All right, and I again want to thank you for your time. Shanna, as always, I look forward to our next conference call so you can give me all the right answers. <laughs> all right. All right, hopefully we have some more information for everybody at the end of this week. I hope so too. All right, well, take thank care, you. stay well, and talk to you all soon. Bye.